Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse 15. Uh, we're going to set the stage for verse 15 here in a minute. But uh, Jesus is speaking, and he says this. If a brother or sister sins, go and point out the fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, It'll be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. A friend of mine uh, says he's giving up on church. Uh, it's a tough conversation. He's, he's, he's frustrated. He's tired. He's not a, he, he actually is a, 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 an ordained minister, but he's not serving in that capacity right now. He's struggling because he feels like he's seen too much and encountered too much and has seen uh, too many heartaches and frustrations that he felt powerless to do anything about. He's also seen his pastor and good friends of his who are pastors treated badly, uh, sometimes by each other sometimes by others in the congregation. He is struggling with whether he even wants to remain. And he's a good guy, great heart, smart, theologically sharp, but he's struggling. And he said to me, Charles, the church just is trying to just keep the institution going. It, It doesn't care about the kingdom. It doesn't care about the priorities of Jesus anymore. It just cares about keeping the institution going and whatever it takes and whoever it has to push aside or whatever it has to do to make that happen. That seems like what's going on and I just can't be a part of that. So I listened and tried to come up with something to say, and I, I just found myself listening more and more, and I asked him to just talk more, tell me more, because I, I, I was hoping that maybe if he would explore his pain a little bit more, you know, he could sort of get all that frustration out and maybe think a little differently. So I did that a little bit more, and he told me more, and, and you know, it wasn't the most uh, cheerful conversation that I had this week. But then he said, um, so why are you still around in the church? You've experienced, he says, you're older than me. I'm a few years older than him. He didn't have to bring that up. But he goes, you're older than me. You've been doing this longer than me. Why are you still not, why are you not as frustrated as me with the church? Why are you still around in the church? And I said, well, man, I I tell you, you could talk to my wife and me, and and we could tell you some really rough stories, too. We could tell you some great things, but we could tell you some tough things. My kids, they could tell you some great things, and they could tell you some rough things about church life over this last, well, Edna and I have been married almost 27 years, and we've been in ministry since day one. Um, I said, I guess, uh, so so I said to him, "I, I agree with you about a lot of your frustration." And I agree with you about how a lot of individual churches and even denominational leaders act. I, not all of them, but some of them don't act right, right? I mean, some of them, uh, it's a problem. And, uh, and I said, you know, we've had our own struggles and frustrations and all that. But I said, I guess the one thing that maybe keeps me in the church the most is that I really think that Jesus hasn't given up on the church. Jesus hasn't given up on the church. 
And that gives me hope. Because Jesus is very creative and very wise and very patient. But Jesus is also very just, right? <laughs> very ethical, very just, very righteous. And because Jesus, and he goes, well, well why, why do you think Jesus hasn't given up on the church? And I said, well, all I know is the first person credited for saying the word church in the Bible, ecclesia in the Greek, he knew Greek, so I was, you know, we were speaking the same language. You know, I said, the first, remember, the first person ever credited with saying the word church, ecclesia in the Greek, is Jesus. He says it before anybody else says it. In fact, you and I looked at it a couple weeks ago in Matthew chapter 16. Upon this rock, I will build my church, Jesus says. And that's the first time that we get the word church. In fact, there's only two times in the Gospels where that word, now it, it, it explodes after Acts, you know, all over the place. But in the Gospels, there's only two times where you get the word that we translate as church. Ecclesia. Two times. Both times, it's from Jesus. The first time, Matthew 16. Second time, we just read it. Matthew 18. If they will not listen to you, tell it to the church. And if they'll not listen to the church, treat them as tax collectors and sinners and all that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But Jesus invented the church. He created it. Now, I'm not saying, look, the folks like me that he created it with, we're not perfect, right? I mean, we've got some flaws and we make some mistakes. But somehow Jesus has this vision for what his church ought to be, and he still believes in it. He hasn't changed it. Now, I don't know if I, I, I mean, my friend and I will stay in conversation, by the way. I don't know if that fixed all his concerns, and I, I, I didn't expect it to. I wanted to just be there, pray with him, listen to him. But he asked me, so that's the best answer I could come up with. And it just so happens I was working on this sermon this week as he was talking. I don't think that was a coincidence. I think God figured that, out, that one out. But here's my big point. Jesus not only is credited with saying church for the first time, but Jesus sees the church as the place where things are made right. You with me? Now, he gives an example of when someone sins, right? And I, I like that the first time Jesus says church in Matthew 16, that he says not even death will be able to stop it. Remember that? The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, Matthew 16, 18. The first time he says it, he goes, this church thing that I'm creating, that, that my spirit will empower, nothing will stop. They might kill you, but they won't kill the church. Still with me? I like that. That's, I, that's what a great vision, right? It's a, this thing that, that my father and I are creating, nothing, don't panic. When, it, when the heat gets turned up, when things are rough, when... when people are just destroyed or, or dispersed or, or scattered, don't worry, not even death will be able to stop it. Okay, good. But I also like that the second time Jesus says church, he says it in the context of folks needing correction. Because, no, I know that's something, this isn't the verse we just read, but where two or three are gathered, somebody's going to mess up, Right? Where two or three are gathered, not everybody's going to be perfect. Folks are going to make mistakes. Folks are going to disagree. Folks are going to butt heads at times. I mean, that's just the nature of things. It's the nature of us. And that's not always bad. In fact, Jesus isn't saying it's bad. He allowed that to happen among the 12. It certainly happened a lot in the book of Acts. We had one group saying, we think, blah, blah, blah. And the other guy goes, no, you're wrong about that. And somehow God's spirit work together in them to keep the church going. Well, I mean, Mount Moriah is 178 years old, for goodness sakes. And I'm, not sh I'm sure that in the 178 years of Mount Moriah, somebody's disagreed with somebody, right? I mean, just odds are, right? <laughs> However, we're still around, small but mighty, but we're still here. 
Um, and I got news for us, and I hope we're here for another 178 years or more, by the way. But even if we weren't, Jesus says, my church will keep going. Oh, I'll figure it out. i got ways to make this thing go. So, here's what we learn, I think, from this. First of all, Jesus believes the church is the best way to do life. That everything should flow through the community of faith and into the rest of our week. Well, how do I know that? Because even at the level of personal sin, personal struggle, personal disagreements, Jesus says, I've got a remedy for that. There's a way to do that. Not like the world does it. I think the world likes shock and awe. You know what I mean? If you mess up, boom, we're going to crush you. You go five miles over the speed limit, that's $120. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, you know, that's, that's the world's approach like we punish and you better, get, you better get the message but the church has this different way of doing it it goes like this if a brother or sister if you see them in error or in sin or, or in struggle go to them individually you take it upon yourself as someone who loves them who's a part of their same ecclesia church, those who are called out by God. That's really what that means. Go to them and say to them, hey, there's, I see something here that I think is harmful to you. Can I help you with it? Like, like we were talking with Joey. I mean, when you jump off and just, you can jump off and just plop to the ground, or you can jump off and folks can catch you. You ever see those concerts? I've never done this, and I will not. I'm 6'3", 240 pounds. That would not work for me. But those folks who fly off the stage, the artists when they're singing, and then they get caught and they sort of crowd surf, that's the church. I mean, it doesn't look like the church at that moment, but that's how the church does things. We are not the ones who go, oh, you want to jump off a stage and test gravity? See how that works for you. Plop, you know. But that's, that's a worldly way of doing it, isn't it? But not the church. Jesus says, if someone is in sin, if someone is defying the laws of God, if someone is bringing something into their lives that's going to harm them, go to them one-on-one. -on -one. Be that person who, who extends the hand of Christ. It's not about punishment. It's about extending the hand of Christ to someone who needs compassion, who needs wisdom, who needs help. Go to them. Okay. Great. Well, I'm glad that it doesn't stop there. Jesus believes the church is the best way to do life. So he, he understands that sometimes when I go to someone one-on-one, -on -one, they go, thanks for your opinion. Have a nice day. And it's at those moments where titles like Reverend and Doctor mean nothing. And that's okay. They, they mean nothing. Uh, I got a funny story about that, but I'll, I'll save it. But anyway, and then... So, so then what do we do, Jesus? Because Jesus, we know that sometimes as much as I might care or you might care, I'm just one person. I mean, we're in this very pluralistic world, this pluralistic society where it's like, your opinion is your opinion, my opinion is mine. What happens when that gets shot down? Ah, Jesus says, I have another way to help you, to help them. <clears throat> Bring with you two or three others who also care about them, not, not just to overpower them, not to make fun of them, not to mock them, but to love them back into the kingdom. Bring a couple others who say, yeah, we think that's a problem too. Not that we're judging you. We just love you, and we're here to bear witness, right? That two or three, that in the eyes of two or three, uh, every word may be established. That's what it says in 1860. Right? So, two or three come with you and say, look, brother or sister, you're part of us. We just, we just don't want you to be harmed. We, we care about you. And it's not just me. It's not just my opinion. We as people who know you, right? Because church folks know you. Amen? My second day as a minister ever I had people that I thought I had known because it was in my home church that I that had been my home church since I was in eighth grade. 
and suddenly I was, you know, youth pastor part time. And um, again, these people I knew, and I, I don't know if that's true anymore, but I remember just where I grew up as a kid, you look at church folks, even if you are one of them, when you're a kid, you, you really look up to them. I mean, that's good. I mean, it, but sometimes we put them on a pedestal. Like, there are people in that church that I thought for sure knew Moses. Like, personally. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I thought, man, this, this guy was around, you know, when the church started. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, you're kids. You, you think that. You, you just see them like they're always there. They're just they're this rock. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that except for... We forget that these are human beings who struggle. And I remember my second day as a youth pastor, this person I'd known for a long time came to me and was sharing an issue he was having with his teenage daughter, who was now in my youth group. And I, I was trying to look pastoral, and I must have looked shocked because I thought they're the perfect. You know what I mean? And they're the perfect family. No, that, that doesn't exist, by the way. I'm very glad about that. But. I, I, I'm just sitting there going, wow, I, I had no you know, I had no idea. And I must have just looked really dumb because I didn't really say much. I just said, okay. I, you know, almost like, are you sure? Are you sure you've got the right God? <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. But here's the thing. Jesus knows all of that, doesn't expect us to be perfect, and has a contingency, has a plan. If there's a problem, go to them one-on-one. But what if they don't listen? Take a couple of folks with you to help them and to help you as well to bring about healing and wholeness in this church that I've not given up on. Amen? You ready? So, okay, we do that, and there, then there comes a choice. The choice becomes for that person, okay, well, man, I mean, you folks have known me all my life. You, uh, <laughs> Most of it. Uh, you, you you know sort of the good and the bad. Uh, some of it, you may have known generations of me. I guess if this is really sending up a red flag to you, maybe it's something I at least ought to take a look at. I mean, it's kind of what you want, right? That's the ideal. But Jesus hasn't given up on the church, and he knows human nature, right? I'm really glad about that. He knows that sometimes instead of Surrendering, we do what? We, we we dig our heels in and go get it, just just get out of here. Right. Well, well, Jesus, what happens when that happens? Well, there's this thing called the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones of God. And we just blab it to the church to embarrass them or shame them. It means rely on the wisdom and the love and the care of the of the rest of the body. These folks that know the score, know what's going on, get them to help you in various ways. Sometimes it's direct, isn't it? Sometimes it's indirect. I'll tell you as a pastor, there are times where I've struggled with a congregation member in the past, in different settings, and I was out of options in my mind of how to deal with them, and some very kind, loving church folk church member who had known that person a lot longer than me latched on to him a little bit extra. You know what I mean? And I've, 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 seen, I, I've seen where that person, that difficult person who may have been in real life rebellion suddenly got their act together a little more. And I didn't have anything to do with it. That's very humbling. But it's also very refreshing. You know, y'all, you want to go up to that person and go, hey, thank you for, <laughs> you know, but that'd be kind of odd, you know. That, that's part of what Jesus had in mind. How we rely on the church. Tell it to the church. Let the church in. Let the church step in and love and try to heal that person. Well, man, how can you, how can you avoid being changed when that many people start really caring about you and loving you? Well, I know stories where it's gone well, but like you, I know stories where the heels got dug in a little deeper. And when someone is, is struggling with guilt and with, you know, the, the worst struggle that 
we face is not against other people. You know that, right? It's with ourselves. And the meanest people that you've probably ever met, if you know mean people, I do. <laughs> not here, but other places. If you know mean people, their biggest struggle is not with you. It's with themselves. Because they're hearing more and more voices that are showing them a better way and they are digging their heels in. And they lash out. They're, you know, they kind of flee, they rebel, they do dumb things, mean things. But what happens then, Jesus? Do you know any stories like that? And Jesus goes, oh yeah, so if they won't listen to the church, treat them as a t- pagan or a tax collector. Now, I have seen this as one of the most abused verses in the Bible by the way, by church leaders. But let me tell you what I really think this is saying. What do what did Jesus do with pagans and tax collectors? He loved them. <laughs> he, 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 he found a way to maintain some kind of presence in their life. Oh, he didn't agree with them, right? He didn't endorse what they did. He sure didn't let them teach us Sunday school. <laughs> Well, that's another story. But I mean, you know, and he didn't do any of that. I'll be mean, clear. He didn't, he didn't appoint them as apostles, necessarily. Although, one tax collector became an apostle because he repented. And he wouldn't have even had a chance if Jesus hadn't hung out with tax collectors. So, what I'm saying is this so Jesus is not going, just shove them off a cliff. He's not saying that when he says, treat them as tax collectors. Okay. In other words, treat them like they're people who need to be redeemed. Are lost because they've chosen to walk a different way than the church. Treat them that way. Well, how do you treat people like that? You treat them like guests. You know, like if we had had a stranger walk in today who knew nothing about the creed and knew nothing about the songs and knew nothing about the Bible, we wouldn't go, get out, this isn't for you. Right? I don't know. <laughs> we wouldn't, right? You're good people. We wouldn't do that. Because that's not the church. What the church does is, hey, come in. Come in, please, have a seat. And uh, I've seen it where you know, we, we had this, this, this guy, uh, this guy who's a winner in Seattle, we pastored in North Seattle for about seven years. Pretty class church. And they, this guy just came in. I, I, I had never seen him before. Uh, and um, he sat, he made the mistake of sitting down by a retired pastor. <laughs> That's a mistake, but I mean, this guy was super friendly, retired pastor. His daughter was on the church board at our church, and just sat down by him just because that was the empty seat there. He sort of wandered in to the back, and I just—I was sitting toward the front. And I saw him come in. I couldn't get up because the music was going, the big worship team, and all that stuff. And so he just sits down. I'm thinking, ah, oh, I probably need to greet him, but man, I'm not going to get to him. And all right. You know, doing the things you do in the service. And more and more, I'm noticing this retired pastor scooting closer and closer to this guy. Right? And he's finally, he, the guy didn't have a bolt and he just kind of came in, didn't grab one, didn't know to grab one. And so, so this, oh, this retired pastor just opened up his bullet and he's pointing out, he's like, it's, I, I'm, he's, it's, he's whispering things to him in the service. And what he's doing is basically giving him worship 101. <laughs> During the church service. And this guy, I'm telling I found out this guy's clueless, hadn't been in church in over 20 years, and forgot most of what he knew. But just kind of wandered in and thought, I'll go to church today. And, you know, walked into this church that was right off, we were right off the freeway, so I guess we were convenient. And he's sitting down by so and this other guy's scooting now. I mean, by the time I'm up to preach, this guy is just right there with them. They're just leaning in. And he's like showing him the sermon notes and helping him build. I mean, it's like he's teaching elementary school or something. It's beautiful. I mean, he's just like, okay, he's writing in the blanks. He's showing them the stuff and he's showing them where it is in the Bible. It's just amazing. And you know, within a month, that guy, and I got to meet him and talk to him just a little bit, but that retired pastor latched on to that guy, ended up having coffee with him a couple times. About a month, less than a month later, on a Sunday, the guy comes in early and says, Pastor Christian, I know we've met. Uh, I'd like to get baptized. 
And I'm thinking, yeah, I mean, been to the class, man. You haven't been to the new member class. You haven't been to the baptism class. We got things. We got ways of. It. I didn't kind of say that, but like, we got ways. You know what I mean? We've got methods. We weren't even Methodists, and we've got methods. We've got things to do. And he, I was like, really? He goes, yeah. I, did you have one coming up? We can. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what to say. I said. Can we, of course, now uh, we do have a little baptism class. We'd like for you to sort of know. He goes, oh, I'll go. I'll be glad to go. But, uh, uh, and he, he said, that pastor, right, he said, uh, he, he kind of explained it all to me. <laughs> you know, and he kind of walked me through it. In, in fact, he goes, pastor, from day one, Pastor Green has just been walking me through it. I don't know if you know this. And of course, I, I did, because I noticed. But he said, I sat by Pastor Green my first day. When I came in late. And that guy, he just sort of explained the whole service to me. He treated him as a pagan or a tax collector. You know what I mean? He treated him like a lost person because he was lost. I think that's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, he is not saying, excuse bad behavior, let bad behavior become, you know, cause corruption in the church. He's not saying that. Because the mistake we sometimes make as the church is he doesn't say put that person who's in sin in leadership or give them more to do so that they'll straighten up. He doesn't say that. We do that too often, but that's not what Jesus says. What he says instead is lovingly correct, give them opportunity to repent. If they don't, keep loving them, keep loving them, and watch how my love transforms not only them, but the church. Amen? Because I'm t- you, you know what, and we baptized the guy eventually, by the way. And you know what happened when he stood up to be baptized. You know what he talked about, right? I don't even have to tell you. Right? I want to thank Pastor Green. Right? I mean, in tears. I want to thank Pastor Green from day one. Day one. He reconnected me to the church. Jesus hasn't given up on that. Amen? I'm glad. I've been hurt. You've been hurt probably by church folk. I don't like... It hurts worse from church people. I get when worldly people hurt us. Okay, I don't like it, but I can handle it. But when church folks get all not I mean, for that, whew, that gets deep. And I'll tell you this. When church folk wander into sin, things that are destructive, for them, it hurts. I mean, it hurts anyway. You know, we hate to see the world in such a mess and all that. But when a church person starts wandering away, that hurts, doesn't it? That, that's, oh, that, what potential. We know that. You know, Jesus says, well, you got two choices. You can just give up on the whole thing. Or you can allow my spirit to work through you. Because I haven't given up on this thing called the church. There's a way to do it. You go to them one-on-one. You go to them with folks who are close, two or three. You, you, you surround them with that love. If they push that away, hey, you know, let the church sort of in, in, in good ways know, hey, we need to pray. We need to reach out. We need to make sure this brother or sister, now, without shaming them, without embarrassing them, we need to reach out to them in love. Um, then what? I'm done with you folks. You, you, you okay, we're not done with you. <laughs> we're going to keep praying for you. You can't stop us from praying for Oh, I, I, I've had people, and those, I've had people say, don't bother praying for me. I'm telling you they said that. That, that freaks me out. I want everybody to pray for me. <laughs> Just go ahead. If you're bored, pray for me. <laughs> if you are, don't have, have anything to do for a moment, oh, I'll pray for Charles. Please do that. I'm begging you. But this person said, don't, even, don't waste your prayers on me. Don't know you bother praying for me. And I, I just, in a moment of whatever, just said, you can't stop that. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, I went, too late. Because <laughs> I'm already praying. And I won't stop. And they got mad. They thought I was teasing them or, you know, kind of, I'm not kidding. I'm not going to stop. There's absolutely nothing you can do or say that will make me stop praying for you or loving you. There's just nothing. Why? Because that's because I work for Jesus. 
right? So you, we, we, we're, we're part of the, the church. That's what we do best. We do best these two things. We pray for people and we love people. Those are the two things we do best in the world. And I don't think anybody else does it better than the church of Jesus Christ. And at our, when we're bad, we're really bad. We're like that little poem of the girl with the crow. We, when we're bad, we're horrid. But man, when we're good, when we're, when we're following Jesus, when we're doing the two big things that we're called to do, which is pray for people and love people, man, there is nothing better. Right? Right? We, we've seen people redeemed. I've seen people repent. I remember one of the big moments as a teenager in that same church that, that I first started the ministry. But as a teenager, I remember someone disrupting, I thought disrupting the service, standing up in the service, and everybody just stopped because apparently this guy was, had, I don't know, I, I didn't know any of the inside stuff, but apparently he was a bad dude <laughs> or became a bad guy for a while or something. And, and was part of something kind of negative years before in the church. And I, I didn't know who they were, but he stood up in the church and I thought, well, this is weird. You know, I mean, this is not exactly how we do things. Uh, and and the pastor stopped. The music was done. The pastor paused. It was right before offering. I remember it. Like, I was 16. I was sitting, like, right there. And the guy says, I know most of you don't know me. I, I, I remember this. He says, but I need to apologize. And he turned to our Sunday school superintendent, who'd been in that church for forever, and said, I need to apologize to Brother Larry. Because years ago, I hurt him, and I said some things, and I was disruptive. And the guy starts crying, big old guy. And I mean, and I was like, oh Lord, I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm 16, going, I hope a fight doesn't break out or something. You know, I, this could be interesting. Um, Jerry Springer comes to Sunday. Anyway, it was, and and he just, and and this guy Larry, who I admire to this day, stood up, went over, and hugged him. And everybody else just kind of hugged him. And, and, and look, the pastor just the pastor goes down and he hugs him. Mean, and then the pastor gets up, it's sermon time, he goes, You've had your sermon for the day. <laughs> Basically. And I'm like, Yeah, I have. And apparently that worked because I'm almost 50 and I was 16 then and I still remember it. And I can't remember a bunch of sermons. But I remember that one. You know why? Because it was the church. Being the church, so I'll, I'll close with this. We got we got to roll. I know. Uh, so again, Jesus still believes in it, and when restoration occurs, the church gets stronger. Right? That's why Jesus spends all this time. He's not saying here's a way to play gotcha. He's not saying here's a way to exert power and to bully people. He's not doing that at all in this passage. What he's saying is. Hey, our goal is restoration. Our goal is redemption. Our goal is 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 uh, is demonstrating, sorry, demonstrating the love and mercy and grace of God. And when that happens, it's only stronger. We become a sneak preview of heaven. Think about that. Like, don't you hate when you sit in a theater? If you do, and you see the sneak preview of a movie. And you think, I've got to see it. And then you go see it, and you realize, I've already seen the best part of the movie in the sneak preview. <laughs> I saw for free the best parts, and then I paid however many bucks to see the rest of this nonsense. I, I, I hate when that happens. I don't like it. Just, just, just tell me that I've seen the best, and let's move on, right? Because that's not how Hollywood makes money, so that's okay. But... Look, we're the church, and we become a sneak preview of heaven. And I'm telling you, it can be really, really good, but there's even better that's on the way. And the church is this one thing, this one entity, where the sneak preview doesn't even compare, as good as it can be, doesn't even compare to the rest of the story. Get it? So, man... I want to be a part of the sneak preview, demonstrating to people what heaven is ultimately like, so that I can be a part of the real deal in eternity for always. And Jesus says, that's why I haven't given up on the church. That's why 
Sin will not conquer it. That's why uh, there's a redemptive process that involves not only God's spirit, but God's people. And I'm glad to be a part of it. I'll close by saying this passage comes after two big teachings of Jesus that are very famous. The first is about the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples asked him that at the beginning of chapter 18, who is the greatest in the kingdom? And I, you know, you know, one of them was going, you know, hint, hint, right? I mean, you know that, but I, I, it's not in there. I'm just thinking. And Jesus basically, instead of calling one of the 12 over to him, you know what he did? He called a little child over. Not the answer they were hoping for. Which one of us is really what they were asking. Jesus goes, see that little kid over there? Hey, buddy, come over here. When you become like this, then you'll be great. Then the second part, causing someone to stumble. Don't, let, don't, don't be a cause of someone to stumble. And then the third big parable, the wandering sheep, the lost sheep, where he talks about the shepherd with the hundred sheep, and he loves them all, but this one goes away. And 99 out of 100 in school is good. I didn't make a lot of those. That's an A+. Plus. But Jesus says, no, no, no. Look, he leaves the 99 and goes after that one and rejoices when he rescues that one. He says, that's the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, if a brother sins against So, right? That's, I just want to give you the context before we go. Right after that, the next breath, he says, now if a brother sins against you, one of those hundred starts acting up, don't just shove them off the cliff. <laughs> go, go to them one-on-one. Take a couple folks with you who you know he'll listen to and who trust. Who, who, who tr- whom you trust and who you know will be trustworthy and redemptive. And then let the church become more involved. Trust the spirit working within this church that I haven't given up on. The fact that I created to be redemptive. And then what? Keep loving them. Keep praying for him. Okay? We don't hand the keys to the kingdom. I, I didn't hand the keys to the kingdom to them. I hand them to you. Whatever you find on earth is bound in heaven. If you loose on earth, it's loose in, he- loose in heaven. When two or three of you are gathered, I'm right there. In other words, there's power in what you're doing, even if not everybody can.